Good morning again. I'd like to ask everybody if you could please find your seats, charge your coffee, get ready for our next event. That was a terrific discussion. Uh, in the interim, our, uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Sue Gordon, has arrived, so uh, we, should, we should welcome her. You'll be up here in a second. Thanks, Sue. All right, I'm looking forward to this. We have a policymaker interview coming up next. Uh, no no wind-up from me. I'll just introduce uh, our interviewer, who is uh, Ellen Nakashima from the Washington Post, great friend of our program, somebody whose, whose work we read uh, daily. And she'll be interviewing uh, one of our uh, keynote guests today, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, uh, John Demers. And so I'll just welcome you up and turn the stage over to, uh, to Ellen and John. Thanks. That's very graceful. <laughs> thank you, and uh, thank you very much, Steve, for that introduction. It's wonderful to be here in, in Austin, and uh, good to get out of Washington for a little bit, and nothing's going on there anyway, but uh, uh, just uh, very delighted to have John Demers here with us to, to talk about a pretty little, fairly little, um, not as well-known department, uh, division of the Justice Department uh, that is actually not part of the intelligence community but works closely with the IC. And John is in a great vantage point to, to talk a little bit about it for us because he was present at the creation back in 2006 and uh, left at the end of the, the Bush administration and went into the private sector then just came back last year. So. John, I think, why don't you open by telling us a little bit about why NSD was created, how its role is different from, say, that of the criminal division at DOJ mm -hmm. and the FBI, and then how the mission has evolved over the years in, in response to the changing threat. Sure. Well, thanks, Ellen, and uh, nice to be here with you, and thank you uh, all for being here today and for having me. The weather is so nice. Uh, it's you're lucky I showed up. Um, <laughs> I'm lucky you showed up. So, um, but uh, so it, it is great to be here. So I'm back at uh, the National Security Division after uh, nine years of being away. And as Ellen mentioned, the National Security Division is uh, the youngest division uh, at the Department of Justice. It was created in 2006, so about 13 years old. Uh, and was the first new division since the Civil Rights Division uh, in, from the 1950s. Uh, so fairly recent creation, and it is, uh, without a doubt, a reaction to September 11th. And uh, it embodies, I think, the post-September 11th uh, law enforcement philosophy of um, how we go after national security threats. And, you know, pre-September 11th, um, the law enforcement worlds and the intelligence worlds, when it came to national security threats, both counterespionage or counterintelligence and um, counterterrorism, were kept quite separate and purposefully so. And it was called uh, the wall, uh, for those of you who, who remember that. And that wall was a very uh, purposeful creation, uh, gradual. Uh, post sort of 1970s, post sort of church committee report creation, with, uh, the idea being that uh, it was protective of civil liberties to keep the intelligence community away from uh, the criminal investigations on the, on the counterterrorism, counterespionage side, uh, the fear being that, you know, folks would use tools that were appropriate to do foreign intelligence in domestic law enforcement um, investigations. And there was a great deal of consensus about that wall um, until, uh, you know, up through September 10th, uh, 2001. And it was, uh, the executive branch had endorsed it and implemented it. The legislature, Congress was very uh, supportive of it and the courts uh, had enforced it themselves. So uh, on September 11th, that changed almost immediately. And the thinking post the 9-11 commission report the idea that we had had uh, access to a lot of the information and had we put the pieces together, we could have prevented uh, the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Um, the wall 
uh, was seen as one of the causes, not obviously not the only one, but one of the reasons why we were unable to uh, connect that intelligence and put the pieces together. And all of a sudden, the consensus uh, shifted. Uh, and it's, I think of it as a warning for anyone who practices in the space that I practice in, which is the sands can shift beneath your feet really fast. And what becomes conventional, what was conventional wisdom on September 10th is conventional folly on September 11th. Uh, and, but it, it's also, I think, a warning because we should always be rethinking um, the assumptions on which we're operating and seeing whether they uh, truly make sense. So what, what they did, so that, you know, these parts of the department that had been very jealously kept apart, um, the counterterrorism prosecutors, the counterespionage prosecutors in the criminal division, and the Office of Intelligence Policy Re of Review, which does all of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrants in um, the in the, the Deputy Attorney General's office, they brought them together and put them under one Assistant Attorney General. Um, and I was there at the beginning as a deputy for law and policy. And they also created this law and policy office because the other thought um, was that when you have operational people doing policy, the operations swamp the policy, and the policy work just doesn't get done because the demands of the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. investigation. So they wanted to create a dedicated unit of people, it's about 30 people now, um, who just do thinking about policy issues on national security within the department. Um, that's the, that was its initial uh, structure, and um, it's, uh, it's been interesting then, you know, fast forward, um, 10 years later, coming back to it, seeing how it evolved, obviously kept uh, in touch with the folks uh, who, were, who were the AAGs at the time. It's kind of nice, I mean, there's only, I'm the sixth assistant attorney general, so it's a very small community of people who have led this office, all of whom know and uh, respect one another. So it's actually a very nice feeling in this area. And you said that when you first started there, it was, you know, Post 9/11, 2006, it's all almost all counterterrorism all the time. Yeah, I mean, so that that's the other shift, yeah. right? And so, one is let me say, I think NSD has worked. Well, coming back, seeing the integration, seeing people who were taught throughout their career that they shouldn't be talking to each other, now sort of regularly sharing information and in the same room and in one another's meetings, it's really great to see. I don't think we had quite gotten there, you know, when I left in 2009. That kind of cultural change takes, a, takes time. The second big change, and this is one that was recognized uh, by the previous administration, was um, the rise of the nation state threat. Uh, and so when we were there in 2006, it was mainly counterterrorism that occupied the time of the leadership of the division. It was post, still post 9-11. It was surveillance, investigations, prosecutions of uh, international terrorism. And we were working out a lot of the issues that I think we've come through, including, you know, the, the surveillance that initially was under kind of an uh, executive branch, Article II authorized surveillance program, putting that under FISA court orders, then getting Congress to authorize a new mechanism for doing that type of surveillance of non-Americans outside the U.S. We were working through a lot of the legal issues and counterterrorism prosecutions. That was the focus. Fast forward to today, and what occupies the bulk of my time is China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And a component of that, which is cyber, right? And um, that was recognized organizationally by my predecessor, who will be here later today, John Carlin, uh, when he created basically a fourth sort of section within the division uh, to work on cyber and other nation state threats. And um, that's, that's really the big change. Mm -hmm. um, there were always counterintelligence investigations going, even you know, back when I was there before. But today, uh, those are the issues that are driving, um, driving the work of the division. And, and how have you, starting maybe with you know, John Carlin did, but how have you sought to apply those tools and strategies that worked in the counterterrorism arena mm -hmm. to these new nation state threats with cyber and uh, economic espionage, things like that? Well, I think, you know, we've tried to take the same approach, which is, you know, we're just going to use all the tools we have to combat what the problem is. Um, we're not going to try to restrict ourselves and say, well, we're going to 
you know, combat this one problem just using a subset of those tools. Um, and, you know, worked, you know, continue to work in terms of integration of the different parts of the department that work in this area. We work, for instance, very closely with the criminal division that also has a cyber unit. They do, we do nation state and terrorist cyber activities. They do criminal cyber. But obviously, if you have a computer intrusion, the only thing you know is at the beginning you've been intruded and, you know, you, you don't know who the actor is. And so, um, you know, we have to work very closely with them. So I think those lessons of integration, of sharing of information uh, are uh, still, you know, alive and well on the, uh, on the nation state side as they have been um, on the counterterrorism side. So the nation state threats are now at the fore, China probably foremost among them. Uh, l last fall, the Attorney General launched this initiative to really bring an enhanced focus uh, uh, to your prosecutorial and, and enforcement efforts on China. Tell us a little bit about what that effort has achieved and, and what are the tools you're using? How have they made any difference? Sure. So um, the China Initiative was really a recognition of uh, the need for us to be sure that we were focused on China. And in particular, from our vantage point, um, the problem of Chinese economic espionage. And so we have, now I have to say, the political espionage is alive and well as well. And we have three current uh, pending cases um, against, um, unfortunately, all sort of ex-members of the intelligence community that were co-opted by uh, the Chinese to uh, spy on their behalf. Um, and uh, it, it, but on the economic espionage side, what we found was that we were just doing more and more cases. And, more than 90% of the cases uh, over the last, kind of since the life of the, the economic espionage statute um, involved the Chinese government as the actor behind them. So, and what we call economic espionage, basically the, the theft of trade secrets for on behalf of, or for the benefit of uh, a state. Um, and 65% of our trade secrets cases, which are just cases among companies and individuals, also involved either Chinese companies or Chinese nationals. So uh, the thing about these cases is they are very complicated. They involve working very closely with the intelligence community. They involve protecting the equities of the intelligence community when you bring these cases. Uh, and so we wanted to be sure that, that they were adequately resourced and prioritized in the US Attorney's offices around the country. Uh, and um, that the U.S. attorneys were educated both for themselves but also to be uh, ambassadors along with the FBI to the private sector, uh, to academic communities to ensure that um, the individuals in those communities understood the, the potential threat uh, to them. In terms of the impact, you know, we're, this is still what, month mm -hmm. six maybe, so, right. you know, it, it's early. I think, um, you know, we, we charged more cases last year than we have ever charged uh, in terms of economic espionage like in any given seven. year, about 12, yeah. yeah. But you see, you, you hear that. These are not drug cases, right? I don't even know what the number of drug cases we charged last year. We, I didn't charge any, but the criminal division charged last year would be a ton, right? So, uh, but, but uh, these are very important cases. I think I give the example of one uh, to sort of try to illustrate what I think the, the benefits are of bringing our cases. Mm -hmm. These cases really build on, you know, the work um, in 2014, the, the, the first charges against the Chinese PLA for commercial espionage. Um, and uh, that was kind of a seminal moment in this area, the thought that you would charge state actors uh, for commercial espionage. Those cases were against uh, military officers or more recent cases I think reflect the shift to the use of the Ministry of State Security, the MSS, the civilian intelligence agencies in China to do economic espionage. Um, and one of the amazing things, if, if you read our indictments on the political espionage side, and you read our indictments on the economic espionage side, and you read them like you would read a story, basically, to see how the intelligence officer from China has co-opted on the one hand, an ex-American intelligence officer, and on the other, say, an employee of, of an American company, you really um, 
come to appreciate how they're using the exact same tactics and techniques and trade craft that they and we and others have honed for centuries to do state to state spy craft um, and trained it against uh, the private sector. But in one case, you know, in particular, so we have we charged at the uh, last fall this case involving Micron. Micron is an American company that makes computer memory chips. Uh, it has about 20 to 25 percent of the global market of uh, memory chips. And it found itself the target of intellectual property theft um, by a Chinese company. Uh, and it's a good illustration of both the, the top-down nature of um, what's happening in terms of mm -hmm. economic espionage in China, but also I think of how these Justice Department investigations and actions can help. So um, China being China and a very authoritarian country, the, the commercial espionage that takes place is not kind of sort of organic and uh, you know, uh, coming up naturally from its various enterprises. It is really a top-down structure. You kind of start with the Made in China 2025 plan which lays out 10 industrial areas in which the Chinese want to be, want to have sort of a dominant domestic manufacturing position. And these are very varied, everything from agriculture uh, to uh, composite materials to artificial intelligence technologies um, to commercial airplanes, on and on, you know, high-speed rail. And, uh, and if you take our cases, you can map them against all of those priorities, right, pretty, pretty easily. So what you see in Micron is the Chinese government decreeing that it is tired of importing all of its microchips. It has no, it has no domestic capacity to produce this type of memory chip. That's going to end. So that's the objective. Of course, that's going to be very well resourced and funded. Mm -hmm. So there's about five to six billion dollars given to start up a Chinese company that's going to produce these memory chips and build this factory, and the factory gets built. Uh, and the problem is they don't have the intellectual property to make the chip. So the solution to that problem is, in this case, you know, go ultimately and enter into a JV with a, a company in Taiwan and then have the company in Taiwan poach um, three individuals from the American company and poach them not in the way that any business person might say, hey, I really, Ellen's a very talented journalist. I'd love her to come to this other newspaper. It's like, what I really want are the Washington Post trade secrets. So Ellen, when you come, you bring, every, you download everything onto uh, you know, a thumb drive and, and bring it over. Uh, otherwise, the job's not yours. So uh, poach these folks, and, and, and that was the plan. Now, what's good about this story, the company realized what was happening. They, they went to the FBI, and that's something we've been working very hard in sort of encouraging the private sector uh, to come forward and uh, work with us on these investigations and not to try to just handle them on their own as an HR matter or something like that. Um, and, and we did the investigation, and we were able to bring the case um, and uh, do two things. One, obviously, char the individuals are charged in Taiwan, so great international cooperation by the government there. Um, charged the company here in San Francisco. Um, and then um, the Commerce Department used its authorities to put, and this is an example of sort of the all tools approach, right? The Commerce Department used its authorities to put the um, uh, Chinese company on the denied entity list. And what that means in short, it's kind of in the weeds of export control law, what it means in short is you cannot, that company cannot import any parts from the United States. And the great thing about that was without being able to import the tooling and other parts they needed to make the chip, they couldn't actually make the chip. So this cycle of robbing the US intellectual property, replicating the product, and then replacing the US company on the Chinese market and global market was broken basically between rob and replicate because they can't, at least for now, get the tooling to make these chips. And it's been publicly reported um, to my satisfaction that mm -hmm. that company in China, that, that, that sort of factory is idle at this point because they, they don't have what they need. So that, I think, is just an illustration of what, we, we can't always get there early enough uh, to do that, and sometimes, you know, you're just trying to punish and deter the offenders, but it's an illustration, I think, of the benefits of what we can do. So, in fact, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, the different types of tools that the government can bring to bear to try to change malicious behavior um, by adversaries. Uh, you mentioned the uh, 
in seminal indictments in 2014 of the five PLA officers. I mean, you know, there was a lot of sort of criticism or skepticism back then of, okay, great, you, you, you indict them, but when are they ever gonna see the inside of a courthouse, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, they didn't. Do you think that in the end, indictments like those really are more of a naming and shaming or signaling effect uh, and, and have you know, less impact, especially if you're talking about intel agents in China who don't, you know, aren't likely to travel outside. Mm -hmm. do, that, do those have less sort of effect or impact at actually changing behavior than say economic sanctions or a commerce entity listing, uh, things that actually affect actual, you know, ability to do business mm -hmm. in the world economy. What do you think? So I think, I think indictments have a number of different purposes. One is the classic sort of criminal justice purpose of deterrence, and let, we can come back to that mm -hmm. uh, in a second, because I think the answer changes depending on who you're indicting. Um, the, the second is a, an educational uh, purpose, and that is, you know, we're having this conversation today because we brought these indictments, and I think we have been able to educate uh, companies, uh, uh, folks in academia, et cetera, because we can uh, show these. W once we do the indictments, they are not classified, they're all public, mm -hmm. so we can talk about the facts, we can tell these stories, and people are much more moved by specific stories than they are by sort of, you know, me going up here and just telling you, Citing watch out statues. for these seven things, and <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I think education is another uh, great benefit they have. The, the third piece is that they um, enable uh, the use by other, uh, or the investigations that underlie the indictments enable the use by other agencies, whether it's Commerce or Treasury, to use their authorities. And so, so if you hadn't done that investigation, Commerce wouldn't have been able to do their their designations? They will do, I mean, they can do a separate investigation Right, okay. um, and they will often, you know, uh, obviously do their own homework to make sure they're not just going to take what we say. They're going to review it all, and they'll they'll do additional investigation. But we we can work together on these things, and so I think we're really helpful to one another when we work together as a government. And it's going to take all of us working together as a government to try to solve this issue. So coming back to to deterrence, um, I think you know it depends who you're indicting. I, I don't know how much of a shot we have at deterring a military officer or an intelligence officer of a foreign power uh, not to do her or his job, right? I mean, they signed up for this life or they've been recruited into this life. This is their life and they're gonna do it, right? There are also other nation states that use contractors to do their work. Contractors are more easily deterred uh, because this might not be the last job they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. They might want to go to Europe and work at a company. They might want to go to the Middle East and work at a company. And once you've been indicted and you're out there and you're, you know, you, basically if you go to a company where we have an extradition treaty, you're going to get arrested and we're going to try to get you back. That happened. And we did that, yeah, this, just this past fall. That he was actually a Chinese intelligence officer who uh, had co-opted uh, the employee of an American company and then traveled to Belgium, and he was arrested in Belgium, and he's now um, in the Southern District of Ohio awaiting trial. So once in a while you can get somebody like that, but I think the other group of people, especially in these commercial espionage cases that aren't pure cyber, that a lot of them are insider threat cases or hybrid cases. So somebody has been co-opted in the company. Somebody who's here has been co-opted. Those people, I think they can be deterred, at least as well as other criminals, right? Because they're here, they're within our jurisdiction, we can arrest them um, and we can charge them and, and uh, they become sort of a warning for other, for other folks who might be thinking of doing the same thing. So I think your level of sort of deterrence impact will depend on who your defendants are. But regardless, I think there are, are reasons to do these cases that uh, you know, go beyond deterrence as well. Um, what about working with other countries? Uh, last December, I guess, or last fall, uh, the, the U.S., the Dutch, and the British all called out Russia's GRU military spy mm -hmm. agency for uh, hacking the U.N. agency that investigates um, uh, chemical weapons attacks and, and that mm -hmm. hacked into Olympic athletes' drug testing data. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then in December, you, you and about a dozen other countries mm -hmm. also uh, called out the Chinese MSS for its mm -hmm. hacks into 
various companies for IP theft and um, economic espionage, and you announced uh, indictments at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Is there a conscious strategy to increase international coordination in this area? Um, do you see other states starting to issue their own indictments, or what, what's your mm -hmm. strategy going forward here? I think there's, you know, in, just increasingly a recognition of the community uh, of interest that we have um, uh, with other nations. We're certainly not the only nation being uh, victimized by uh, whether it's intellectual property theft or the kind of hacking and, and dumping that the Russians were engaged in with respect to the World Anti-Doping Agency. Um, there, uh, many other countries have, have gone through this as well and have seen what has happened in other countries even if it hasn't come happen to them. So uh, we do work, I mean, I think it's just a part of the work together that's done uh, by the intelligence communities of these different countries, by the law enforcement communities of these different countries. But, you know, I, I think, yes, there's some increased recognition that among the work that we're going to be doing together, this is going to be one of the threats that we're going to have to confront, because it's not just a threat to the US or a threat to the UK or a threat to France or whoever, it really is a, a threat to all of us. And the tactics and techniques are um, very often the same. Now what was amazing about that anti-dumping uh, case, was, the anti-doping case, was um, that you know, the, the folks who were charged were not just sort of these remote computer hackers, but there are these teams of close access hackers that the Russians had sent um, to various countries to break in basically to the Wi-Fi of a hotel or an office building, et cetera, something they couldn't quite do remotely, but they could do if they you know, and when they finally caught them, and um, their equipment was in a car parked outside the building that they were trying to hack into. So it was a great kind of spy story as well. Right, right. And talking about, you know, your speaking indictments, I mean, I think that was part of it, the value of the country and our citizens. And uh, that work is not over by any stretch, but uh, it's really helped. And you know, we need to apply that same approach, I think, on the, on the cyber side as well. Can I, can I ask you a question about, uh, you, you mentioned that the impact of, of indicting a, a target or person depends on who you, you're indicting. And one of your most high profile cases right now is uh, an, an indictment of the uh, daughter of the founder of Huawei, the world's you know, biggest telecommunications equipment manufacturer. She was the chief financial officer of Huawei. And uh, she's in Canada at the moment. Canada arrested her on, on a warrant from the US. Uh, and you know, you're seeking extradition. What kind of, tell me a little bit about the thinking behind charging, say, the executive of a, of a company like Huawei, which is a national champion for China, versus just charging the company itself. I mean, do you, it, it was certainly created a diplomatic incident, but do you, you know, do you consider those ramifications when you're trying to figure out, decide who to charge? I mean, do you think maybe this might really get their attention and cause them to change behavior in some way? I mean, explain that. I mean, I really can't talk about that case given its status. Uh, oh well, in just in terms sort of, of litigation. A uh, but I will telecommunications say that, company. Let's you know, say <laughs> we we do um, yeah, abstracting it even a little bit further sure, out. Abstract uh, as far as you want. <laughs> right, uh, no, I mean, look, we do work um, at, with our interagency partners. You know, we work with the intelligence community. We work. You know, we, we certainly you know, have to let the State Department know, uh, you know, if, if we're gonna do something like that. Um, and um, uh, because you, you do have to, uh, these cases do have, can have geopolitical uh, impacts and um, it wouldn't be fair for us just to sort of go blindly and doing things without thinking through these sure. issues and, um, you know, uh, thinking them through with other folks as well. But you believe there, if you believe there's enough underlying criminal behavior, it warrants a charge, you're I mean, ultimately, the that's what we do, right? right? We're the Justice Department. So we follow these facts, we follow the law wherever they lead us. Sometimes they lead us to 
um, individual defendants who we can charge. Sometimes we can charge the company because of the actions of the defendants. But ultimately what we're doing is just what we would do in any law enforcement uh, investigation and criminal investigation is follow those facts in the law um, wherever they, you know, wherever they take us. Yeah, some, and these cases also don't just have uh, potential diplomatic implications, but also economic ones, especially in, uh, you know, national security cases involving major countries like China, the world's second largest economy. There's an almost inherent tension between the economic and the national security side. Um, you know, and in fact, we even have an example of the president suggesting at one point that he might intervene in, in this hypothetical case uh, if it were to advance hypothetically his his trade deal. Um, you know, have first of all, have you ever had any interference or any any request or pressure from the White House to at all? No. <laughs> Is this a congressional hearing? No. <laughs> <Like>, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Curious minds want to know, but you know. I, look, all right. What what has um, economic um, uh, implications is the theft of intellectual property from American companies, right? So, can the case have an effect on sort of the, the economics of a relationship between countries? Sure. Can un addressed the theft of intellectual property over the years, over the decades, have an effect on? you know, our uh, economic success, sure. And we have cases yeah. uh, like Sinoval, which is a wind turbine case where 700 people lost their jobs. Um, and that's just, you know, on day one, like that's not trying to extrapolate what the sort of total economic impact over time is gonna be. Those are the folks who were put out of work because a Chinese competitor stole their intellectual property and created a wind turbine uh, to compete with theirs. And that is happening over and over again. And if we don't confront it, you know, it will come at a great economic cost to us over time. Great. Uh, now you, moving to Russia for a minute, um, you know, Russian information warfare burst onto the scene in 2016 with the president in the presidential election, and, um, and as I mentioned earlier, these speaking indictments that the special counsel's office brought really, uh, especially those of the um, the GRU and the Internet Research Agency, really helped raise, I think, public awareness of what it was Russia was uh, up, up mm -hmm. to. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs that you have to weigh between disclosure and protecting sensitive sources and methods when you, you know, decide how much to make public mm -hmm. in these mm -hmm. indictments? Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I do think, you know, w one of the reasons why I think in our system indictments are so powerful a persuasive tool is because we're, I'm not asking you to take my word for it, right? What I'm saying is I am telling you I can prove these allegations beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors using only admissible, non-classified evidence, right? And if I cannot be sure of that at the time that I bring the indictment, I'm not gonna bring the indictment, even against people who I think I have no chance of getting. So th these are speaking indictments, but they're all um, sort of disciplined by the requirement, this imposed requirement we have on ourselves that we will not bring any indictment at all, regardless of whether we have the defendant, unless we think we can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that means that we have to work really closely with the intelligence community in this area, because we, um, even if the allegation in the indictment would not disclose a sensitive source or method piece of information, if I thought in order to prove that allegation at trial, I would have to do so, I can't put that allegation in the indictment at all. So this, wor this requires really working closely with them, which is something we do every day. We are one of the um, roles of the National Security Division within the department is to be the voice of the intelligence community within the department to understand the equities in the intelligence community, mm -hmm. to mediate those equities against uh, sort of the equities of the U.S. Attorney's offices and others who uh, are, are looking to bring a case and see if we can find a solution. But it's, um, that, that is very often a challenging aspect of these cases. And one of the reasons why you see, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons why you see a difference in the percentage between sort of economic espionage and trade secrets is sometimes we know from intelligence sources that that company or that individual 
was doing the theft on behalf of the state. But we can't charge it that way because it would reveal you know, intelligence sources and methods that we're not going to do it. And then so we just charge it as a trade secrets case. Right? So those are some of the options we have you know, as we try to figure this out. Interesting. A quick sort of more news area. The Russians seem not to have been as active in the midterm elections as they were in 2016. Mm -hmm. what, do you have any opinions to what was behind that? Uh, were any of the, you know, any, any operations or indictments or sanctions affecting their behavior? Were they just trying to keep their powder dry for 2020? Um, and, you know, are, what are you expecting for the next year's race? Is that I think, um, I don't want to speculate too much. I mean, this is, they certainly were not as active um, this past election as they were uh, in the previous one. I think DHS, the FBI, um, the intelligence community working together have made a lot of progress in this area of foreign election interference. I think the partnership between the law enforcement agencies and social media companies has gone a long way to the social media companies' decisions to remove uh, content uh, from their pages. That's like, you know, sweeping your front porch when it's dusty out. Like, you just have to keep doing it. You'll never get it totally clean, but you will make a difference, right? Um, and uh, so I, I do think there were things that we did that uh, there was much more collaboration between DHS and the state election uh, officials, a lot of more information sharing than we had two years ago. And then I think that we as a public have become uh, better educated about that threat, about, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of our ability to assess um, and try to figure out um, when someone's saying something, who is that person? Right, yeah. who, who is and being maybe a little more skeptical about it. Okay. Now, I don't know what that means for 2020. I mean, I, I uh, certainly don't think that they've just folded up their tents and gone away. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they'll be back. But I do think there's a lot of good work that was done in the last two years and that will continue to be done right. over the next two years that I think will position us in a, in a much better place than we were you know, two and a half years ago. And last summer, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein announced a new policy. He was at Aspen where he, he said, mm -hmm. if you, with high, fair, high confidence, detect foreign interference or meddling in democracy, mm -hmm. you will uh, inform you know, the public about it. Right. Um, what's, the, you know, what's the significance of that and what's the threshold for triggering that level you know, of, of disclosure? Um, yeah, the so the significance of it is, I think, a recognition and for those of us in government that we, you know, have to be a little bit more forward leaning in what we're sharing about uh, foreign election interference or political influence. Um, and that we, um, you know, we just, we can't, even in, you know, obviously sort of keep it to ourselves because we're still trying to figure it out. Um, that has to be balanced against, one, the certainty that you have in any given case that what you're seeing is in fact uh, foreign political interference and it's from this country or that country. Um, and also what, you know, the benefit to be derived uh, from that. I think, you know, traditionally the FBI, DHS have, uh, if, if somebody in particular is the target, let's say, of a computer intrusion, you know, you would share that um, with the person who's a target in order to help mm -hmm. them remediate, et cetera. So that's a piece of this policy. But going beyond that, which is when do we tell um, the public, right? And it's, it's going to be a really hard judgment call. And, uh, you know, I think everyone has slightly different views of when to do that. So um, I, I don't know that we had, uh, we, you know, we certainly sort of gamed out a lot of the, had different hypos we were running through in the run up to the election and last summer and the fall, try to figure out, kind of have these conversations before they happen. I don't think we confronted our hardest scenarios last time. Okay. So we'll have to see. And uh, one area gaining prominence uh, in, in the public here, thanks to the Russia probe, is, is the area of counterintelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and often the work that the investigators, like the FBI, do uh, remains secret you know, for, for years. It doesn't, mm -hmm. because it doesn't lead to any charges or right. anything. So how, how, 
what is your role in that? When do you get involved and uh, what role do you play? How, how do you help them decide whether or not to bring charges or just keep something secret? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think you know our main role is helping them to assess whether there are charges to be brought, right? I, I think ultimately the decision of whether to charge something or to keep the investigation running for counterintelligence purposes is one that's made by the FBI or by other elements of the intelligence community. Um, and our job is, I think, to tell them, hey, this other avenue could be available to you should you choose to go in that direction that is prosecution. Um, we uh, are, you know, we, we don't really push prosecution, you know, I think it has to be one of the, um, the options that um, the decision makers have, uh, but ultimately that decision of, you know, do you, do you go public and try to disrupt? Um, have you sort of got all the intelligence that you're gonna get out of this operation? That's really an FBI uh, decision. But they consult you fairly early on? Yeah, so we okay. do work with them, right, right. you know, early on, uh, both because, um, you know, one, we, we wanna be able to tell them what their other options are, and two, if we are gonna go to prosecution, we wanna make sure that we are gathering evidence in a way that will then create admissible evidence in court. Uh, and you know, if you're doing it just as an intelligence operation, you may be gathering evidence in a way that we, we couldn't disclose, at least not without risking sources and methods that wouldn't be worth uh, disclosing. Okay. And when we talk about uh, China, it's, it's not just the cyber enabled economic espionage or uh, IP theft. Uh, increasingly, we're also hearing from the government the uh, foreign influence, a Chinese influence mm -hmm. uh, issue. Um, Dennis Wilder talked a little bit earlier about not mm -hmm. you know, going too far to the mm -hmm. other side and demonizing uh, you know, Chinese Americans, but talk a little bit about what you're seeing in, with China undertaking um, you know, recruitment activity or influence activity mm -hmm. in the US and how are you trying to counter that? So um, it, it really runs the gamut. And I think, look to Dennis's point of the three ex-intelligence officers who are charged right now with spying on behalf of China. Two of them, you know, are not ethnically Chinese. They're not, you know, they're not sort of uh, Chinese at all. So it's not a problem of sort of Chinese Americans. It's a problem of, in those cases, intelligence officers that, that uh, ultimately, sort of at least are alleged to have betrayed their country. Um, so uh, that, that's one aspect of the work we're doing. On the, on the political influence side, that is still mainly um, a counterintelligence operation right now of you know, looking at um, Chinese uh, behavior. It's not like Russian behavior, right? It's not, they're not out there um, on social media trying to sort of exacerbate the divisions uh, within our society or the different points of view within our society. That is not really their um, objective. Uh, and what, uh, you know, their objectives are uh, more to support their own policy preferences on a number of different issues. So if it's Taiwan, claims to the South China Seas, um, the Uyghurs, uh, Tibet, you know, the, just the, the normal sort of catalog of Chinese policy influence, and, and they're able to sort of, um, their, their ability to, um, uh, you know, project their power and their influence in areas that are uh, important to them. Um, some of it, I mean, I think the vice president talked about even just like, yeah, I mean, some of it seems like classic uh, uh, behavior, like, uh, well, we're gonna put um, tariffs on goods that are, you know, of uh, importance to your constituents, right? Um, that's not a surprise, a lot of, uh, countries have done that over the years in trade areas. Um, but, but, but there is an element of covert action um, that is really still the province of, mainly of counterintelligence operations going on right now that is being tracked. And, and earlier this month, you announced a big shift in FARA enforcement, mm -hmm. FARA being the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, and you noted that it's the appointment of one of Mueller's uh, former prosecutors, Brandon Van Grack, who's gonna head this new mm -hmm. unit. Uh, 
Yet already, you know, over the past few years, the, the unit had begun to become more aggressive mm -hmm. about going after unregistered foreign agents, uh, resulting, in fact, in prosecutions mm -hmm. like uh, that of Gates and Manafort. So how exactly will this more aggressive posture manifest itself, and where are we likely to see more registrations and enforcement efforts? Mm -hmm. So we've already seen a significant increase in the number of registrations under FARA, um, probably about 25%. Um, that's uh, really good, because ultimately, uh, the purpose of any prosecution is compliance with the law. And compliance in the law in FARA means you register. And really, the purpose of the law, and it's quite an elegant solution to what otherwise might be a thorny First Amendment problem, is saying, I'm not gonna to try to restrict anything that you're saying, but you have to tell me who you're saying it on behalf of, right? You can't pretend that, oh, this is John Demers, who used to be the AAG for national security, and he's saying American policy should be X. Now, this is John Demers, who was the former AAG of national security, who's saying American policy should be X, and I'm getting paid by this foreign principal, right? So, and that allows us uh, to assess for ourselves uh, the weight that should be given to anybody's statements. So our goal is compliance with the law. And one of the tools I think that, you know, we've used more recently than we had in the past are uh, prosecutions to, um, to, to enforce and to try to get that transparency, which is really ultimately what we're after. Um, what I love about Farah too is, you know, Farah just celebrated its 80th birthday last fall, and uh, so you go back 80 years, and you know, we're talking about Nazism and, and uh, communism, and that that's it was that. And in those days, it was more like letters to the editor and you know other folks who were speaking on behalf of, of Nazi Germany that the statute was really uh, going after. And it's just um, you know, it, it's it's always good to reflect historically and give yourself a sense of perspective that. We have been here before, we have seen this before, we have fought this before, and you know, we have survived it before. Are there any more tools you're, you're seeking in that area to help uh, bring about compliance, maybe administrative subpoenas? Is that something you'd like to see happen? That's something we're definitely taking a look at, um, and there are some proposals on the Hill to provide um, administrative subpoena authority under FARA. I do think, you know, right now, the way these FARA investigations go, you see something in the newspaper, you read about something, et cetera, you approach the person, and it's, you know, it's more of a voluntary approach, um, and, uh, and they respond, obviously, and they have to respond truthfully, but um, I think subpoenas would give you a more fulsome uh, response. And what about civil fines, do you think? Yeah, that, I mean, that could be an option, too. I mean, right now, one of the, you know, you, you kind of have the, um, if, you know, you, you could charge someone criminally with a felony, um, and, but, you know, there may, there, the more gradations you have of tools, oftentimes, the better you can sort of uh, pinpoint a tool at a certain set of facts. Mm -hmm. And talking about sort of the role of your, uh, your division here, um, you know, Special Counsel Mueller's work is over, but tell us a little bit about your role uh, with, in overseeing his work, and now that it's over, how, what will your role be going forward as Mueller's bequeathed a number of cases to other uh, U.S. Attorney's offices? What's, just, what's your role in this? Yeah, so we, I mean, the, the Special Counsel's Office was overseen by the Deputy Attorney General and then the Attorney mm -hmm. General, so not by us. Not you directly, but we you have. We did send um, some attorneys over there, like Brandon is one mm -hmm. of the folks you mentioned, others as well, to help um, provide resources for um, the work he was doing. And then, you know, there have been, as has been reported, a number of cases that have been spun out of the uh, work that he did. Uh, some of those, so take, for instance, the, um, some of the, um, the Russia cases, there was a case against GU, GRU officers for hacking and dumping that is now sitting you know, in the National Security Division since those defendants we don't have yet. Uh, and then we're working with the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. in an active case going on against Concord Management, which is the um, company of Prigozhin, who's one of the Russian oligarchs who's alleged to have been involved in 
the sort of the social media campaigns. So we'll have a, you know, these, this is a bottom of counterintelligence investigation mm -hmm. and, you know, those counterintelligence investigations ultimately sort of fall back within NSD and I'm sure we'll have a continued role so you'll be Together getting busier the in the coming months. Going forward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, in the few minutes we have left before I want to open it up to questions, can I just ask you a couple of terrorism uh, <laughs> questions? I mean, this is, after all, what you, know, you first started out yeah. doing, right? Yeah. So many years ago. Um, with, with ISIS having basically lost its caliphate, though it's not been entirely defeated, uh, you know, the State Department and DOD have made clear they, they want states, other countries, to take back their foreign fighters right. and for, for prosecution. Uh, and, and some of them have been reluctant to do so either because mm -hmm. they lack the, the tools you have or they fear that if, you know, these people get convicted, they'll be out in a few years and on the streets radicalizing people again. Uh, but the U.S., by comparison, Ms. Harrison, has been a little more successful in this arena, right? Mm -hmm. You brought, tell, tell us about how many foreign fighters you've brought back for prosecution and what factors you weigh when considering prosecutions of foreign fighters who either kill Americans or are Americans, mm -hmm. things like that. So I think um, the success story on foreign fighters actually starts before then, and it's the number of cases that we brought over the last, say, five years of um, people who tried to become foreign fighters and tried to leave the U.S. to go to Syria. Uh, we brought, you know, over um, a hundred prosecutions of folks who um, attempted to join uh, ISIS overseas. Obviously, if you stop them, then they don't, you don't have the problem of repatriation because uh, they're serving time in jail. So um, that's, I think, where, where we were very successful. Um, we have repatriated probably say fewer than 10 mm -hmm. um, U.S. Uh, citizens who were foreign fighters. I think the number goes up a little bit if you include uh, folks who we kind of captured. They got distracted while they were in Turkey or whatever, you know, they, that we captured sort of on their way there or, or they took a detour and then we, we brought them back. And there are a few folks who came back and then we discovered later that they had been foreign fighters and we brought charges against them. So, um, we haven't uh, done a, a huge number of repatriation cases. On the other hand, um, you know, there aren't a large number of U.S. citizens who are there uh, in uh, Syria, uh, you know, who, who there are to repatriate at the time. There is one case, you know, there's some litigation going on right now that I can't really get into about, you know, whether a, an individual is a U.S. citizen or not. Um, and we'll see how that case kind of plays out in court. Um, but there really are uh, f few folks at this point to repatriate who are U.S. Mm -hmm. citizens. Now, uh, we, we do try uh, to convince other countries, really the State Department do to try to convince other countries to take back their own citizens. We um, try to help them to do that. We have sent prosecutors around the world continue to do that to um, train folks in how to do terrorism prosecutions. Uh, the FBI and uh, the military have shared evidence, battlefield evidence that they've captured with foreign countries to help them do the prosecution. So, you know, we don't just say, hey, you guys go take care of this. We are trying to support generally their ability to do terrorism prosecutions and then also specifically to um, provide them information that would um, help them convict individuals. And I think, and, and we've been successful in a number of those cases where we've given them, you know, a roster or somebody's application package uh, to join ISIS. And I always love to think of, you know, ISIS as just like this bureaucratic organization where you have to like apply and yeah. here are my skills and here, you know, here's one of my interests and, you know, um, it's like we're just all humans, you know, <laughs> trying to organize ourselves, some for more nefarious purposes than others. Um, but so uh, that's been our push. It'll continue to be our push uh, going forward. And, and obviously, it's a continued challenge, uh, particularly depending on you know, how long the Syrian Defense Forces will be able to hold on to the detainees that they've held on to so long. Thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? Maybe just one or two questions. OK, for the audience? All right. Is there a microphone? Gentleman here. 
A few years ago, President Obama and Xi had a supposed agreement to reduce China's cyber economic espionage. Mm -hmm. Apparently, somewhat empty agreement. Is there anything we should do to enforce and hold to account and provide deterrent consequences to nation state actors for their ongoing bad behavior in addition to whack-a-mole indictments <clears throat> and publicity? So I think, um, sure. I mean, I do think that in that case, that indictment helped to put pressure uh, to reach that agreement, the sort of diplomatic agreement. I think it, you know, it certainly hasn't been an unalloyed uh, success. Um, uh, but the private folks in this area say that it did change some Chinese behavior for some period of time. I think that, you know, other very good tools, as I talked about, sort of the Commerce Department's denied entity listing. So if you see a Chinese company that's been the beneficiary of, um, uh, of intellectual property theft, kind of punishing them through either sort of Treasury Department sanctions or Commerce Department uh, listings are also effective ways of trying to get at that problem. There's all, you know, as I said, this is going to take a long time. It'll require kind of whole of government approach and a, a sustained effort in this area. Yeah, just to follow up quickly on that, part of the reason I think she uh, came to the table in 2015 was the threat of economic sanctions that were going to be imposed by the U.S. on China. Uh, in the end, he came with this you know, pledge not to conduct economic espionage, and in re re um, response, the U.S. did not impose those sanctions. But I think I've asked you this before. I mean, you know, do you think maybe it's time to rethink reimposing those sanctions or imposing those sanctions mm -hmm. or should we have in the first place? It, I mean, it's something that, you know, we think about, um, you know, ultimately that's, you know, th those are Treasury Department sanctions and really they're sort of best positioned to talk about how they think through those issues. Um, but it, it's a useful tool still to have out there. Of the suite of tools, is it, how do you rate it as the most impactful or potentially? Um, it's, uh, look, in the Micron case, nothing was more impactful than Commerce Department's denied entity listing, right? So I think what's more impactful really depends in, in each case. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, thank John very much for this uh, thank, great thank hour. Thank you.